Hi and welcome. If you're new here, I'm Tony and I basically use Formula One as my excuse to talk about all things sports, business, politics, media and technology. And I specifically love looking at things that sit at the intersection of tech and media and media and sports, sports and politics, etc. And today I want to talk with you about sports content creators, the rise of the edutainers, specifically in the sports space and the shifting media landscape and how we as consumers consume sports and sports content. And I'll also talk about my own journey as an edutainment content creator in this idea that I always love to educate people and help share the things that I've learned along the way was always trying to surprise and delight and always offer some form of entertainment even though entertainment isn't always specifically the first lens that I look at things through but the education aspect is always what comes first and I'm starting to realize that the more you can merge those two together the more you're carving out a really, really strong niche for yourself, something that very few people will be able to replicate, which means that you get to hold on to your job as long as humanly possible. The article, because there's generally always a story, an article, a piece, a podcast episode that kind of kicks off this this headspace that I end up being in, is this piece that was written by, I think he was Mr. Beast Manager, I think he's moved away ever so slightly, even though they're still very much working together. And he wrote this piece about the future of sports consumption and how he felt like there was a mass untapped market right now in how people consume sports and the type of sports content that was created. And although I agreed with almost everything that Reid put in his newsletter, there's one thing that struck me and stood out to me is that the lens through which he was explaining this was very much 20 to mid 30s male content, which means that the diversity of examples that he was giving was, well, not very diverse. And it perpetuated this idea that sports is still very much a male dominated space, which I really hope we understand by now, especially in the last, I want to say, four or five years in this landscape, that we've come to realise just how not male-dominated most of these sports are. It's just that they've felt very much like that because we've handed the mic, handed the opportunities, put the camera in front of mostly the men. But one thing is very, very clear is there's a massive opportunity to dominate the YouTube sports landscape right now. And the opportunity is there across the board in all types of sports content and quite frankly in almost every single series. And on top of that, I've seen an increasing amount of tech content creators like myself who started to look at technology through the lens of sports and starting to have a look at how technology is disrupting spaces like tennis, Formula One, Formula E, Cell GP, content creators like Marquez Brownlee and Cleo Obro. And then there's another bucket that's really interesting, which is the bucket of athletes turned content creators, either as a sequencing to the career that they had as athletes or in parallel, the realisation that we are having right now is that a lot of athletes are requested to also be their entire media empire as well. Which actually brings up a really interesting question, which is probably for another YouTube video, is are we asking too much of these athletes to be present on social media, to be as authentic as possible, to create great merch lines, to have media empires and to continuously feed us behind the scenes authentic content? So yes, you've got content creators like Destroying who are absolutely taking over this space and Pat McAfee as well. You've also got publications like The Sportish, which is essentially a very different take on not your dad's and not your boyfriend's type of sport with a very feminine approach. And in that same vein, we've got content creators and influencers like Morgan Riddle, who came at it from, I am on tour following my partner who is a tennis player, but I'm making an opportunity for myself as well along the way and taking people on the road with me and since then, she's also gone into Formula One and the F1 Academy as well. Mostly her content was tennis up until very recently. But when I say tennis, she what I loved with Morgan is she never pretended to be an expert in tennis. Instead, she was taking a very different approach and saying, I'm new to tennis, so let's discover it together, the educational aspect. And then the entertainment aspect is, well, I also so happen to be a partner of one of the best American tennis players, and also I love fashion, so let's have a look at it through that lens as well. The one thing that is true with all of these different content creators is they are tapping into and bringing along their own audiences, often audiences that are not the typical traditional sports audiences, which means that the series and the leagues are absolutely benefiting from this increase and this wave of new people discovering their sport through all of these different content creators, which in my opinion is absolutely exciting. So let's talk sports content creators, the rise of edutainment, how the landscape is shifting and how we are consuming sports a little differently these days. So as I said, the sports landscape is absolutely ripe for disruption. And that's everything from sports news, commentating, 
watch-alongs, watch parties, the lifestyle and entertainment side of things, and the behind the scenes from series and leagues, but also the POV from athletes or previous athletes. All of this type of content is absolutely still underserved on YouTube right now. And actually when talking with someone who works at YouTube about what's the type of content that performs really well in sports, he gave the example of Formula One. And if you look at, I think, the top three or the top four best performing videos on YouTube has actually nothing to do with the on-track battles and cars out on track. It had to do with the personality of drivers in the behind the scenes, which gives us a little bit of an inkling and an insight into the type of content that is performing well and the type of content that fans today want to see more of. And we're seeing this across the board more than ever. This landscape, the sports media landscape, is ripe for disruption and it's absolutely being turned on its head, more specifically because of the new types of technology that's coming in, but also us and our consumer behaviours. You have, for example, Netflix that is tapping into live sports shows, which we didn't think that they would be doing. So instead of spending a lot of money on broadcasting and media rights, they're doing things like the Netflix Cup or the Netflix Slam, which is very much looking at the sports, golf and tennis, through the lens of what does the new tennis consumer and tennis fan want to see in terms of tennis content? What is exciting to this new demographic? Teams and leagues and all the different series are doing a lot more behind the scenes footage and trying to really tap into the personalities of their athletes. Docu-series have absolutely had a moment, even though I think we're putting too much of a lift on these docu-series to completely rechange the sports landscape and to bring in this whole new audience. And I've done many videos on how that isn't actually completely accurate. We've also have this new wave of athletes turned creators or family members and partners turned content creators, bringing us unique insights. And that's been really interesting to see which series and which sports are offering this type of content. We know, for example, that a lot of the wives and girlfriends and partners in Formula One would have a really hard time providing that BTS behind the scenes footage because of the very very strict media and broadcasting rights that we have in Formula One. And another big thing that I've noticed is influencers seem to be adding sports events, sports tournaments, big global sporting events to their roster of other events that they would normally attend and cover things like Fashion Week and the Met Gala. These sporting events are absolutely being integrated into that, which is actually really exciting to see because again, it's bringing in a whole new and different demographic and new audience into sports and diversifying it in the meantime, which is again, great. I'm not gonna spend too much time on Pat McAfee, but I think it is worth highlighting him as a phenomenal blueprint and playbook for how sports commentators have an absolute opportunity here on YouTube and also on streaming platforms to completely disrupt this space, which has gone very much undisrupted for a very, very long time. I'm not going to talk in this video, but it is worth also having a look at the show Galazzo in football with Kate Abdo and Thierry Henry, because I think there's something really interesting that they've done there and also tapping into a new audience and having Americans discover football or what they call soccer in a fun and entertaining way. So as I mentioned previously, Pat McAfee has completely tipped the sports commentating world on its head. And I think it is safe to say that he has done it better, has executed it better than probably anyone else right now. His playbook for what sports content should look like sits at that intersection of entertainment and educational. And that is clearly a winning duo. People tune in because of his strong personality and they want to see what he has to say. I think it's something like 320,000 people tuned in to watch his live coverage during the NFL draft, which I think came to nearly 2 million total views, which is absolutely insane for just one YouTube channel. And on top of that, we later discovered that he didn't have actually any exclusive access or footage or pictures, etc., which I love and I want people to note this because a lot of people, especially F1 content creators, often request or ask to get access before they think they can do the thing that they want to do. You don't need access to commentate on a sport that you love. And again, I think Pat McAfee is a perfect example of that. And what's fascinating is even though he wasn't getting this exclusive content, all of these people were still tuning in to hear directly from him, which speaks volumes to what he brings to the table. He now has his daily show and simulcast now on ESPN. And I think they average anywhere between 50 and 90,000 views per show. And I think the thing here worth noting here is that ESPN for a very, very long time has been ESPN first, personality second. And Pat McAfee is a perfect example of that being tipped, which is 
personality driven and ESPN is second. He holds a lot of weight in that relationship. I mean, as one article put it, Pat McAfee and Stephen A can do whatever they want because they are bigger than ESPN, which again, it is a new shift that has happened, a move away from the brand to the personalities, which is still pretty new, which I think highlights this opportunity that we have right now for content creators, because we are seeing this with the existing commentators in mainstream or traditional media empires like ESPN. And obviously, if you think about content creators, the one thing that we don't have when we come to it, we don't have a big name and a big logo and a big brand behind us. And a lot of creators that succeed today have succeeded without the weight of a brand. And it's interesting to see what both Pat and Steven are doing here in this space by shifting that narrative. And YouTube as a whole is absolutely fascinating. I think right now YouTube is the second most watched media distributor that we have. And to put that into context, 8 million people tuned in and watched the Super Bowl on YouTube, not on traditional linear TV broadcast. And YouTube as a media giant's message right now is very, very clear. YouTube isn't linear TV. It is something bigger, better, and fundamentally different. The idea here is to rethink how we consume long form content. And I remember being at a Bloomberg event in October of last year, and the new, then newish YouTube CEO was saying, we want to be the place where you watch a 15 second video, a 15 minute video, and a 15 hour long video if there was one. And there are. And I think it's okay to say that it is bigger because it has billions and billions of viewers and it is also able to very much tailor and target niche and different segments and audience segments and demographics. There's this incredible article in the Washington Post about the beastification of this space. But what a lot of people seem to get wrong is this idea or this concept that YouTube is a replacement for cable and linear TV. And I really don't think that is the case. I think it sees itself as something di different, bigger and better. And I think, again, if you look at Mr. B spending on an average video, he is very open on the Colin and Samir show in this article that he will spend three to five million on a video because the return on investment is what, four, five, six times that. But anyone who is spending three to four million on a single YouTube video knows and understands the importance of this platform and where it's going and the fact that this is just still the beginning of YouTube. And I think this article put it really well into perspective that the cost of a Mr. Beast's YouTube video is roughly the same as an episode of Game of Thrones, which is kind of insane. And I think this is the whole idea that we're seeing right now is that this convergence of Silicon Valley, creator economy and Hollywood all coming together and shifting things and creating something that is bigger than the sum total of those three worlds colliding and coming together. And obviously the big question for YouTube as a platform is what comes next, what's coming after this. And we had the rise of vloggers and we had right now with Mr. Beast, this sort of very succinct, super edited, fast paced, fast moving, very polarizing, sensationalistic content. And I think a lot of people are seeing this slowing down a little bit. And I think this again is the perfect opportunity right now for this rise of entertainment and education videos coming together. And basically the big question that people are asking, is it out with the influencers and the vloggers and in with the educators? And this also comes at a perfect time where Instagram is struggling, trying to rethink their model and trying to rethink their platform. We don't know if TikTok is, is going to have its ban in America arriving anytime soon. And so again, really prime for YouTube as a platform to be the home for this new type of content creator and this new type of content. So let's talk about this rise of intellectual influencers and edutainers. And there was a big piece in Business Insider. There was another one that caught my eye that speaks very clearly on how they're seeing this concept and this idea with the influencers and in with these edutainers, which again, if you look at someone like Morgan Riddle, this is something that she has done incredibly well. It's yes, she will call herself an influencer, lifestyle influencer, lifestyle vlogger and YouTuber. But, but there is always an element of educating in all of her videos, whether it's this is the race weekend format for the F1 Academy, whether this is come and experience my first F1 race and see what I've learned along the way, whether it's like, hey, this is what a Grand Slam is. This is what's unique about Wimbledon as one of the Grand Slams in tennis, etc. There's always that component that's always very, very clear and very, very present across all of her videos. And one of the reasons for this that was in the Business Insider article is the barrier to entry right now is as low, I think, as it ever has been to create content which means there's an incredible amount of noise, which means that influencing and being an influencer is a cutthroat space right now because there are a lot more people entering it than 10 years ago, even five years ago, which means that you need to find ways to stand out, which also means that people are 
have a lot more options to choose from from a consumer perspective. So they're going to stick with people who offer both entertainment and education. And look, I can very openly talk about my own experience in this space and my own work. When I started, what was it, five years ago, my idea was always to take people on a journey and share with them what I am learning along the way or share with my audience what I know and what I know to be true and opinions and how I form opinions and the big questions that I have or in real time share the things that I am learning as I am learning something new, whether that is in Formula One, whether that's in technology, whether that's in AI, crypto, you name it. And I don't know if it is just because I'm now more established five years on than I was five years ago, and I'm sure there's an element of that, but I am definitely seeing a lot more opportunities today in that kind of thought leadership entertainment space than I did four or five years ago, even just two years ago. And I think I shared this on Fred's the other day, but I cannot wait for the day where we have a social platform where it is solely about the content and not the numbers and the views. I think everyone wants to talk about authenticity, but at the end of the day, we will have a boss to report to. And it is very cool and easy to be able to say, we paid for this creator or this influencer to come and look at this video got 8 million views, 20 million views, you name it. It's a much harder conversation when you're just like, look, we paid all of this money. And the reality is this person made three or four videos and they only got a total of 20,000 views, 40,000 views. And I have seen both sides of that. I did a video not that long ago when I was at the Canadian GP and it got across the two platforms where I posted, I think 10 million views. And there was a huge amount of hype around it and everyone was very, very excited. I don't think there was a huge return on investment with that video. It got a lot of eyeballs. It was very, very fun, granted. But I'm not sure I convinced anyone in particular to become a Formula One fan. Maybe I'm wrong. And then recently I got invited to give a keynote speech about or a keynote talk about Formula One and technology and business practices and media and all the things that I love. And when I asked them why me, how they found me, it was because of a very small video that I had posted on YouTube, a short YouTube shorts, that I think got maybe a couple hundred views. And it was interesting because their gateway was this one video. They didn't care about the views. They absolutely loved the content. And it just so happened that I was exactly the niche type of speaker that they needed for this event that they were actually, funnily enough, hosting at Kota. So again, made perfect sense. And they wanted someone that could ground them in Kota. But the fact that I had a massive portfolio and I had five years worth of content made it an easy sell for them. But it was really reassuring to know that it wasn't about my views and it was about the quality of my work and the fact that I had provided some educational but also entertaining content in that very, very short video. And so they couldn't wait to see what a 45 minute presentation would do. So there's something really cool about how this video with a couple hundred views got me my first keynote speaking opportunity in this space. I've talked a lot and I've done a lot of thought leadership in technology and politics, but this was a new environment for me. And I'll do another video on this, but it also reassures me about how finding a niche, a very, very specific niche, is incredibly valuable. Yes, it means that the amount of people that you're going to appeal to all of a sudden becomes very small. But those people in that niche are, you are offering them exactly the type of content that they want and that they will return to every single day or week or month for whatever cadence you're offering it, because it is exactly in that Venn diagram of the thing that they want to hear about. What you might have to give up for that, and it's great if that's not what you're looking for, which is definitely my case, is fame and big numbers and, you know, a million views on videos and being invited to all of these parties and these events because of the status that you have because of those millions of eyeballs. But instead, you get invited to talk and you get paid very good money to talk about this niche that you have become an expert in. And the thing that I repeat again and again and again, especially when it comes to sports and growing sports series, is we need it all. We need the influencers with the huge platforms and the massive followings that come and take a few pictures and put it out there and put it and tap into their audiences for their audience to go, I didn't know she liked Formula One. I didn't know she liked tennis. Well, that looks cool. We need the creators who are going to take you on a journey and convince you to stick around in whatever space that they love. Again, whether that's sports or elsewhere, but let's stick to sports here. So we need those content creators that you want to invest in. You need the, quite frankly, the athletes turned content creators who are also the experts in this space. You want the family members, the athletes, partners to showcase and highlight if they wish to do so, the behind the scenes and the kind of footage that we feel privileged and lucky to be able to get access to. And then obviously we need the leagues and the series to do their own content, but we truly need it all. 
to create that fun and diverse ecosystem in the sports space. And Jordan Rogers actually did a really good video on TikTok on this. He's ex-Nike and who talks about we need sports content creators and we also need the athletes turn sports content creators and the difference between the two and the added value that both parties bring to the table is really interesting to look at. And I think we're going to see a lot more opportunities for sports content creators to have their own shows on YouTube, on Twitch, live streaming and to offer something new and different. And no, they might not garner the millions of views, but they're going to create these really active communities who want to hear from them, who won't consume Formula One, IndyCar, tennis through any other means than through the content creator that they've created this relationship with because they are offering something or they're offering the sport in the way that they want it to be digested and they want to consume it. Sports, I think, as a whole also has been very undervalued as an engaging platform for content creators, which is why I think we're starting to see brands tap into the entertainment value of sports, whether that's with tennis, with the Grand Slams, whether that's Formula One, whether that's IndyCar, you name it. But I think that's the magic piece here is there is something attractive, there is something unique, there is something different that is driving people to want to create content around these sports and basically mega global events. And I think we're going to see this a lot with the Olympics coming up. We're even seeing this with like the NHL draft recently that happened inside the Sphere in Vegas. Like that was a moment that I think a lot of people would look at and go, gosh, I wish I knew about this. Gosh, I wish I was there because it was absolutely entertaining. And it also had that additional value of it served the purpose. And then finally, the thing that I'm getting increasingly excited about is realizing just how much sports as a platform is a phenomenal avenue to talk about societal challenges and issues that we want to tackle, whether that's equity, whether that's diversity, whether that's equal pay, whether that's equal pay, sorry, whether that's climate change. Sports has such active and engaged audiences and is such a fun platform that this is an incredible way for people to start talking and to discover potentially societal issues that they might have not normally think thought about. And again, this is something that I love is that intersection of politics and sports. And I have created a lot of videos about debunking the myth of let's keep politics out of sports because those two have been intertwined since day one. But these are all the things that are getting me really excited about the rise of content creators and educational content creators in the sports space. And I think I get often asked this question, is there still room for new F1 content creators? For, for example, is the space not saturated? And yes, the space is getting increasingly noisy, but that means that there's much more opportunities here. And the way you get through the noise is by creating something of extreme value. And that extreme value comes from offering entertainment and offering education. That was it for me. If you're still here, thank you for sticking around to the end. If you like the content I offered you today, please press subscribe and let me know if there's other topics that you want me to look at. If not, I'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.